I know there's no such thing as a curse. You know, things aren't cursed, areas aren't cursed, regions aren't cursed. But can we just decide that the water where the Titanic went down might be cursed? For crying out loud, this is a harrowing story. These people, tourists, trying to look at the wreckage two and a half miles down from the surface of the ocean, now trapped in what seems to be a makeshift submarine. They've got air there, we're told, until Thursday. Is there anything that can be done? Well, this guy might know, Brent Sadler, Senior Research Fellow for Defense over at Heritage Foundation. I, I've heard calls for the U.S. Navy to send one of our submarines over there. What could they do even if they did find them? Well, uh, yeah, the only thing that a, a U.S. nuclear submarine is going to be able to do, and they're based out of uh, Groton, Connecticut, not too far away, they could basically listen for sounds of life, i.e. someone banging with a hammer on the side of the uh, of this submersible. But being able to pull people out or to bring that submersible to the surface, that's not something a, a, a submarine built for war is going to be able to do. They just don't have that capacity. Yeah. And they can't search the ocean floor either. I I've heard that um, it, it could be trapped in some of the wreckage there of the Titanic. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have like rovers that can go on the ocean floor or on debris like that in the same way they go on a planet? Well, there, it's interesting you ask that because uh, there are reports that nearby, I don't know how close nearby it is, in the open ocean it could be tens of nautical miles away, that there was actually a, a, a vessel that had undersea rovers on board doing a pipeline work. And so I think they're moving onto the scene to help with the search. But again, a small our little submersible unmanned vehicles not going to really be able to do much. And at the depths we're talking about, not likely to be able to get a pressure or to bring atmosphere, oxygen to that crew. Uh, the quickest way to save them is to get a deep submersible rescue vessel, uh -huh. a DSRP, that's made to do that, to bring it to the surface. That's probably... But again, we're talking hours as we get closer to Thursday. Have you taken a look at the design of this vessel? It, again, I don't know, but it sure seems a little janky to be going two miles under the yeah. ocean surface. Uh, yeah, I had some concerns when I looked at the pictures, but again, uh, it has made, this company has been operating for some time. That vessel has made several trips uh, to these depths but again, it all comes down to, it's human error most likely in my experience that usually results in a catastrophe under the sea. Uh -huh. And it, you have to maintain the material condition, you have to maintain the electronics, the propulsion systems. And since you're in the ocean, it's unforgiving. So it may not be the design, it could be even the maintenance and the upkeep of the device. And it could also be an act of God. Uh, there are currents around that area. This, this vessel can only go about three knots, about three and a half miles an hour. And the currents around this area can get pretty strong. Uh, and again, there's fishing nets you could get tangled into. There's a lot of things that could happen yeah. that are completely unpredictable. I heard someone in analyzing this make this claim, and it's not a claim, I, I think it's true, you tell me, that we've actually shot more people up into space than we've sent down at this level in, in the ocean. Is that yes. true? Yes, actually. The, uh, the, the world's oceans, the deepest depths, are the most unexplored and unsurveyed places in our solar system, quite frankly. We know more about other planet moons than we do about the, de the deepest parts of our oceans. And we're still discovering life that we had never seen before down there. So there's a lot of unexpected environmental. I'm not thinking there's some sea life that's causing the problems here. Yeah. <laughs> Insinuate that. But, but there are things down there, currents different types of patterns uh, of the way that the sea behaves. Uh, there was an Indonesian submarine that was lost by what was what's thought to be an upwelling, which is where rapid temperature and salinity changes caused a submarine in the Indonesian Navy to lose control and sink too fast and go and to crush depth, basically, and they lost wow. the entire crew. So given that, it, it's, is it a good idea to do this sort of thing? I know that um, a lot of tourist spots and areas in Alaska and in the Caribbean, you can get these little submarines, but, but that's not two and a half miles down in the deepest, darkest depths of the Atlantic. Uh, should there be some limits on this sort of behavior? Well, I think the first limit is good common sense as a customer. When you put the money on the table, you should be assured that there is a backup plan. Uh, it doesn't seem like there was a vessel standing by to be able to bring oxygen or to try to bring it to the surface. 
there wasn't any emergency distress pinger that was detected on the surface that we've heard about. So was that by design or was that caught inside some type of net or entanglement of the wreck? Don't know, but a good design would have a backup plan. Yeah. So first, first and foremost, be a smart customer. Uh, we've also become accustomed in our society now that wherever we are on the planet, and if Elon Musk has his way with his Starlink satellites, literally anywhere we are, we'll be able to get some kind of signal to communicate. But that's not the same under the water. How quickly does one lose any type of communications back to the, the ship up the surface? Well, as you get deeper in the water, the frequencies that can, can basically get deeper and deeper get longer and longer. And the longer the wavelength is, the slower the data transmission. So a couple hundred feet, you might be able to transmit like one or two characters a minute. So it's painful text messaging at best hmm. uh, when you get to that depth. Uh, the most likely or the most sure way to keep communications with a vessel like this is to have a cable connected to it at all times. That may not have been the case. They may have been operating with a slow data transmission acoustic kind of beacon to transmit very, very short text. You know, not to get too morbid here, but um, assuming they are still alive, the passengers in the sub, uh, and, and knowing the situation that they're in right now, what, what are they going through? Can you imagine? And, and is there, I know that they have air, but is it fresh air? Is there some sort of reserves in tanks? How does this exactly work right now, what these people are going through? Well, there's, there's probably the, the closest modern uh, example of this was the Russian submarine, the Kursk, that sank in about 320, 350 feet of water. Uh, unfortunately, they, they couldn't get in to rescue them out of there. So access to the people is important at great depths and is extremely challenging. But I think it's important to have maximum optimism uh, as as we get closer to this deadline, maximum optimism that the crew is alive until we find it, and then be focused on the mission of just of trying to search and find this, this uh, submersible. So but uh, 96 hours is all it's rated for. It probably didn't have any of the things that we have on nuclear submarines to extend uh, oxygen levels. They probably didn't have that. So 96 hours, maybe some creative human ingenuity, they might be able to eke out a handful, dozen more hours of life wow. uh, under the sea. It reminds one of the Apollo 13 mission and, you know, trying to eke out every bit of, of extended time and oxygen up there in outer space. But again, at least there they had communications. So uh, just to button this up here, the only possible scenario here, it sounds like if they find them, is to bring some sort of device that could help uh, 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 surface this vessel. And, and also, isn't right. there a, a timing concern there in terms of the pressure that the vessel is under as it slowly ascends? Yeah, as a diver, what, you, what you're referring to is called the bins. And that's if you're, if you're breathing pressurized air and then you come up too fast. But in this case, the inside of this submersible is atmospheric pressure. It's the same as if you were at the surface. So the speed of ascent, you're really just limited to how fast you can move up. Uh, you're not going to hurt the people in that case. Yeah. Uh, Listen, maybe I'm a little less adventurous, but I mean, I, I understand the fascination of the Titanic and it's, and it's romantic and everything. We got a perfectly good movie <laughs> and we've got a documentary. I mean, I just, I can't imagine what was going in people's minds that they would put themselves at risk like this, but this is one of those, it's sort of like climbing a mountain, I suppose. Yeah. So when I, ha having done some wreck dives myself at some very deep depths as well, uh, I can, the, the, the curiosity or the desire to go further into and to discover something that no one has seen can be pretty high. Mm -hmm. And what I hope didn't happen is that, that that submersible crew didn't take it inside or try to get too close to the wreckage and got entangled. I see. Uh, but it is, it is an allure. I mean, to go where no one's been, to see something that really has been basically a time capsule. It's locked in time yeah. to the day after it sank. Well, no, thank you. Thank you for shedding some light on the, I, I don't think it's in everybody's character to do that. So for those people who do have that curiosity and that yearning that would even take the risk to do something like this, I appreciate you sort of fleshing that out for us here. Uh, and yes, we, we need to keep absolute total optimism here and hopefully this will have a happy ending. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. There's more to come on O'Connor tonight. Keep it here at Salem News Channel.